hear about politicians in the context of crack cocaine or wasted money or whatever. And then we usually hear about activists in the context of uh, they set a police car on fire, right? They smashed a the window. I've literally been part of protests where 50,000 people marched down the street peacefully, creatively, with banners, with puppets, with songs, and then 10 idiots start smashing windows and setting police cars on fire, and that's the headline. That's the photo in the paper. That's what sells. So a lot of people have real negative associations both with politics and with activism. And part of my work is to show that activism is actually incredibly fun, can be incredibly creative, and has nothing to do with putting on a suit and smoking crack cocaine, uh, or putting on a hoodie and smashing police cars. The nonprofit sector is enormous, vibrant, fun, effective, and not covered in any of the mainstream media. We're just not exposed to the good things happening in the world. So I'm here to share a few stories with you of good things I've been working on. Um, and I've actually been successful at getting some of my products in the media just to compete with crack cocaine and traffic accidents and trains derailing and whatever people like to read about, you really have to be creative. And you can use the same marketing techniques that corporations use to sell soap and jeans and use them to sell amazingly important, uh, positive political ideas. And in fact, we need to use clever marketing to move progressive political ideas forward to cut through all the other messages that we're being bombarded with every day. By the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions, comments, criticisms, uh, laughter, um, whatever. <laughs> okay, so I started a group about 10 years ago called the Toronto Public Space Committee. And uh, the fun thing about the world we live in now, which we, I mean, really even just 10, 15 years ago, you didn't have, is because of the nature of the internet, you can create an organization and through good design, make it look like there's an organization when in fact you just bought a domain for 20 bucks and you don't have a website. And you couldn't do that 20 years ago because, I mean, uh, I mean you could, I guess, with a business card, but it's, it's easier now to trick people into thinking that you're part of something larger than you are. So when I started this group, there was no committee. It was a committee of one. His name was Dave. <laughs> but I was able to make this website, and I, I declared myself the president or the executive director, I don't remember. But that allowed me to send out press releases and be quoted in the paper as the representative of this group. Over time, the group grew, grew, and there actually was a very large number of volunteers and a committee. Um, if you care about an issue and want to move it forward, it's really important to come up with a brand. And again, you've probably mostly heard of the term brand in the context of selling products. Branding is so important in the nonprofit sector, in the political sector, because if I just send out a press release saying, billboards suck, I hate billboards, we should take them down. Here's three reasons, I'm Dave. Like, probably not going to be out of that. But simply by saying, I'm Dave Meslin, spokesperson for this group, here's a quote, we're proposing this policy statement, and then you do some kind of creative event, you will get it in the paper. And it's amazing how powerful a brand is. The journalists need that brand credibility to justify the quote. Does that make sense? And I'll give you a few examples. Um, so one thing we did with this group is we, we did a lot of work around the visual environment and what I would consider the erosion of our public spaces and um, you know specifically eroding it with uh, a, a, a massive rapid expansion of outdoor advertising in Toronto. I love advertising uh, and I think advertising is an important role to play. I think sometimes it's witty, sometimes they're funny. I doubt many ads are informative. It's not really their role. Um, but I don't mind advertising. The thing about public space is that the first word in public space is public, right? It's our space. So companies will always have way more money than nonprofit groups and activist groups and community groups and schools and libraries and anything, right? Companies have a lot of money. So they have enormous budgets to get their message across. And that's fine. That's capitalism, free market, whatever. The thing is, they can put those ads on the radio, on TV, in newspapers, in magazines. There are private avenues that allow them to get their message across. Ideally, we live in a society where you were getting those corporate messages, but also being exposed to the other side of the story, right? So community messages coming from nonprofit groups, from your local neighborhood center, from your library, from the local school, right? And the one place where we could do that so easily is public space, right? So you've got a billboard saying, buy a car. A lot of billboards saying buy a car, right? There are groups in Toronto 
trying so desperately to encourage people to not buy a car, or at least drive your car a little less, take transit, ride a bike. We need more bike lanes to make it safer, because if we had more bike lanes, people would bike more. If we had a better transit system, people would take transit. We don't need to push people out of their cars. We need to give them a better alternative so they'll make the switch on their own. But who can afford a billboard for that? Well, actually, Civic Action and other groups can come together. That's very rare. So, or we can take a fast food billboard, right? Or take, take Shell. There was a big campaign a few years ago with Shell and the activities they were doing in Nigeria and accusations that they were funding you know, military groups that were attacking unions who were trying to protect labor fights in Nigeria. But you don't see the two billboards saying, Shell, buy our gas. No, don't buy their gas, right? Public space is the one space where we could balance it. It'll never be balanced on TV. It'll never be balanced in the page of the Toronto Star. Because how many of you could afford an ad? How many of you could afford a billboard, right? What are they, I don't know, 10,000 a month, 20,000 a month? A bus shell is probably 5,000 a month. 4,000 a month? None of us can afford that. None of the groups I'm involved with can. We could use public space like this as a massive message board for schools, community groups, nonprofits, and charities to get the message that we can never hear because some of the, some of the most important messages out there simply aren't profitable to say. But they're important to say. So I would actually argue that, that there should be no commercial messages whatsoever in public space. If we gave all of public space over the community, it would still be a tiny fraction of the other messages we're getting. The advertising sector, as many of you know, if you work in the sector, they become very effective at finding ways to engage us where we're a captive audience. Because the truth is a lot of people don't like ads. Because a lot of them are designed to be annoying. Repetition works in advertising. And sometimes it's really not fun as a, on the consumer side of that. Um, I can't listen to the radio anymore. It's like the ads just drive me crazy. Um, so, what, so, so what do they do? They know that people are listening to 30 minutes ad-free, or they're paying more for, for um, satellite radio, or they're doing their PVR thing on the TV and watching it back without the ads. And the advertising industry is like, what are we going to do? Well, you put an ad in an elevator. You put an ad at the gas pump. You put an ad in the urinal, right? Like, where are you going to go? You're standing there peeing. Well, not peeing, we we'll standing there peeing. And uh, like, there's an ad in front of you. So they're getting really invasive. And again, that's the free market. We can't stop restaurants and building owners from putting ads in elevators. We can do something about this. This is our space. And let me add two more things on top of this. Diversity. We're always priding ourselves in Toronto of how diverse we are, right? The most diverse city in the world. It's so amazing. We're so lucky. It's our biggest asset. And then we cover our public spaces in imagery that doesn't reflect the diversity that we're allegedly so proud of. This is our town square, folks. This is the town square of Toronto. Anyone who looks at these ads won't see themselves reflected back in those images if they're not um, young, attractive, based on society's definition of attractive, white, and I think almost every person that you've seen done that is white. If there's more than four or five models in a picture, they'll throw in one black person just to be diverse but it ends there. This guy's, well, you can't get whiter than that. <laughs> um, they're all straight. You're gonna see two guys holding each other on a mat down that square. You're gonna see someone wearing religious scarf, what's it called, what, what, what do you, sorry. Yeah, will you see that in an ad? No way, will you see a Jewish yarmulke? Will you see a hearing aid, a cane, a wheelchair, anything that makes Toronto what Toronto is? We are diverse. Some of us are religious, some of us have a physical disability, some of us are gay, some of us are short, some of us are fat. So we're decorating our town square with imagery that actually makes most people in Toronto feel like tourists alienated in their own city. Oh, that's disgusting. There's no reason we have to do that. I want, and we could change the um, advertising industry to try and be more diverse. I don't care, that's not the point. This isn't their space. Why are we letting them put stuff up there in the first place? And the last thing I'll say is, and I hope I'm not offending anyone who works in advertising, um, ads are often designed to make you feel bad about yourself. Because it's a good way to convince you that you need to buy something to make your life better. So you smell bad. Your teeth aren't white enough. You have too much dandruff. Your clothes are sticking to you in a static way that makes you unpopular. And if your show clothes weren't sticking to you, you would have a better love life and more friends, right? I mean, you have to do that to then say, and if you buy this, you'll now be happy, right? Do we really want an industry that's committed to making us feel like crap doing all the exterior designing of our public spaces? 
And of course there's exceptions. I mean, I'm not saying all ads are bad. Again, I like ads. There's some fun ads. I don't know if there's any here. No, kind of boring. Bottom of um, So I would say that in public space, I, this is right beside Ryerson. People right next door, probably that building there, that one, they're producing, like Centennial, amazing art every day. Videos. Um, Print art, whatever you call it, non-video, static art. Put that up on the screens. Some people accuse activists like me of saying, "Oh, you want a dull city with no? You just want you want to whitewash everything." I'm like, "No, I don't mind having video boards, but let's let's fill it with stuff coming from the community." I'll also point out that every billboard here and every word is in English. You go through the neighborhoods in Toronto, you'll find Greek and Russian and Korean and Chinese and whatever. And then we go to our town square, Toronto. Every word is in English. If we had communities and nonprofit groups and charities producing these messages, we'd see the diversity that I see right in front of me. You guys are Toronto, and you don't look anything like the faces I see here, which is our town square. Anyway, that was a big rant. That wasn't even part of my speech. The point was, I started this group, the Toronto Public Space Committee, to create a public voice to stand up for preserving our public spaces and the way we use them. Um, and we had a lot of success at City Hall doing a lot of uh, really fun advocacy, actually getting billboards taken down, fighting against proposals for new billboards. There's a huge fight right now around digital signage because they want to bring in these massive LED boards that will be visible from residential areas all across the city. And uh, I think it's important to stand up against that. But I didn't want to just do the policy stuff. It gets really heavy and kind of boring at times. You're reading through staff reports, and volunteers will burn out quickly if, if you're just doing the heavy policy stuff. So we wanted to do fun, metaphorical activities that got people thinking about public space without having to read through a 30 page staff report um, or make a deputation at City Hall. So it's called an orphan space. An orphan space is a piece of I guess, I won't say grass, soil, that has been abandoned. The city owns it, it's between the curb and the sidewalk, between a sidewalk and a building, and it's dying. No one's watering it, no one's planting mm -hmm. anything. So it's an orphan space, and we started this fun group called Gorilla Garden, where essentially we vandalized the city with nature, not with spray paint. And we'd sneak out, and we would tell people, you don't need to be an expert gardener, you don't need to have any experience or fancy tools, all you have to bring is a spoon. You bring a spoon, we'll have seeds, we'll plant things. And the beauty of it, I mean, it's not really going to transform the city. Toronto's actually a pretty green city. It's not as if we don't have flowers anywhere. What's beautiful about it is that one of the barriers to engagement is that people don't have a sense of ownership over things beyond their own private property. And we talk about apathy a lot, that people don't care about things. People definitely care about things that they know is there. So people take care of their homes. You all take care of yourself. You wear beautiful clothes. You're taking care of your hair. You all have nice haircuts. You probably take care of your vehicles, your, your I don't know. We, we put a lot of effort into things that we know is ours. So one way to get the public engaged in politics and in community participation is to get them to have a sense of collective ownership, right? That the city is ours. It's, it's, if we don't take care of it, no one else will. And the beautiful thing about Gorilla Gardening is that as soon as you put that spoon through that top layer of soil, it might literally be the first time in your life that you actively try to transform something beyond what you actually own. Outside, you've all hung up artwork in your homes, you've all put things up in your lockers, you've all whatever, right? We're constantly transforming things that we know are ours, constantly, to make them beautiful and comfortable. And uh, uh, so this is a metaphorical act of, of uh, physically manifesting that idea of collective ownership that if we don't take care of our city, no one else will. And, and it's a heck of a lot of fun, too. And you meet fun people. So uh, this is also through the Toronto Public Space Committee. Uh, lots of folks showed up. A lot of the flowers died two weeks later. We, we need a gorilla watering group, I think. <laughs> uh, so a whole separate thing. Um, but then we had another fun one called um, the Town Town Defense Project, where we defense neighborhoods by taking fences down. So this is a chain link fence. They're kind of ugly, chain link fences. Um, I also think they're kind of evil, right? Um, they're evil because they, they put forward really negative messages. A fence wrapped around your front lawn sends two messages. One is the one beside you, between your home and your neighbor's home. And it literally says, stay the heck away from my home, right? Um, this is the line where your property ends and mine starts. And don't cross it. Thank you. Have a nice day. But I'm actually more concerned about the fence we put 
front of our home, right? Because that one is the physical manifestation of that barrier. I'm gonna take care of my home, I'm gonna take care of my living room, I'm gonna paint the walls, I'm gonna hang up art, I'm gonna vacuum, I'm gonna take care of my porch, I'm gonna take care of my lawn, boom, here's the fence. That belongs to, I don't know, the mayor, city council, the, the, the state. That's not mine. I, I'm, I'm delineating the end of my responsibility. And I think we need to take down that fence in our minds and realize the city is ours and that we have that sense of collective ownership. So what better way to take down fences in our minds than by taking down fences on our lawns? So we don't sneak out at night and take down fences. That would, that would get us in jail. Um, we started this thing called the Downtown Defense Project and we literally put flyers on people's homes. Um, and the fun stuff about this is none of this, we don't have staff, we don't have money, we're not being funded by any organization. These are just fun projects that me and some friends did and it's amazing how much impact you can have by just being creative and using good design. The only post-secondary education I have is uh, one semester at George Brown learning Photoshop and Quark. Um, many, many years ago. I never went to university, I just did that. And if I could trade that in for an MA in anything, I wouldn't, like, that's just like, I feel like that's all I need to get through life. Just knowing good graphic design because it allows me to take a message and reach so many people so quickly and so powerfully. Not that this is so beautiful or anything. And then I learned just a few years ago that I wasn't allowed to use pork anymore, I'm not switching to some other thing. That was devastating for me. Um, fence community, open community. Now imagine not having those visuals there. And right off the bat, no one would even look at this flyer, right? Um, and we essentially offer them a philosophical argument why they'd be better off in their lives without a fence. And then we offer free fence removal. Call us up, and we'll take down your fence. And it was kind of a risk. I didn't know if anyone would care. Is anyone going to phone me up? So here I am designing flyers, making copies, putting them on fences, not knowing if anything's going to come of it. So you have to take risk in, in all this work. Uh, and the bigger risk you take, the more rewarding the outcome is likely to be. I also didn't know if anyone was going to help me take these pieces down. Um, but I did anyways, and sure enough, people started calling me. Yeah, I got your flyer. Never, I've never thought about my fence. I moved into the house, and there was a fence, and it's never been a big part of me, and I hate it. And your, your photos are really convincing. So uh, take down my fence. So um, then I was kind of like, well, I don't know how to take down fences. <laughs> <laughs> like the metal of each pipe goes into a big ball of concrete in there. Like I, I kind of freaked out. But I recruited volunteers to this growing, growing committee, which actually at this point existed, the Toronto Public Space Committee. We had 2,000 people on our volunteer list. And I was like, last time, last year we asked you to show up with a spoon to reclaim public space and do some gardening. Now show up with a pair of pliers. We're going to take down fences. And, um, People showed up, we had an enormous amount of fun. We had to buy power tools and learn how to use them. We got legal advice, we should have a waiver, which we never did, but luckily no one chopped off any arms. Um, first you gotta remove all the, all the mesh, then you gotta take away the pipes. This is out of Euclid. Here's a before and after picture. This is one hour later, same property. All these people have done something which I think rewires something in your mind, which is actively participating in changing the community around you. It's not something we do a lot. Again, we're constantly changing our own internal private community. And every time they walk past a fence, they'll have that idea in mind, should I knock on the door and ask if they still want that? More importantly, by becoming aware that your actions can lead to a change in your community, it means that they're uncomfortable with how long the waiting line is at their hospital, or that their library isn't open on a Sunday, or that they have to wait too long uh, in the emergency room, or that their nephew has earning minimum wage and it's not enough to even get by. Instead of just saying, oh, that sucks, they'll say, maybe I can change it. Because it, it, it changes the mathematics in your mind between action and change. And I have a TED talk online, it's a short seven minute talk that essentially says apathy doesn't exist. There are societal barriers that perpetuate disengagement by discouraging us. And feeling hopeless and having a defeatist attitude about change is not apathy, it has nothing to do with that. If people were truly apathetic, we'd be in big trouble. If people actually didn't care. But if there's just something preventing them from acting on the fact that they care, we can identify those barriers and dismantle them. And that's what a lot of my work is about. Um, oh, I forgot I had that one. This is just a few weeks ago. That's our newest one. Um, what's next? Okay, so I did this project, well, which Donna mentioned, uh, two years ago now. Anyone know the fourth wall with the turnings? It's a theater term. Some of you must know. I got a nod, but it's a 
uh, it's the wall between the, the end of the stage and the beginning of the Right, exactly. So if I was on a stage, which I kind of am, there's a wall behind me, two walls on the side. This is the fourth wall, right? It's the virtual barrier between an audience and the stage. And in theater, it's a very important term because for the actor, it's okay. The actors are talking to each other, and a really good actor will literally become so wrapped up in the script that you actually disappear. They, they get transformed into another world, right? Um, you interact with the fourth wall in the exact opposite way. You're constantly looking through it all the time, but passively, not talking to anyone, not talking to each other, not talking to me. And I find that it's, an, it's a good analogy for politics these days because I feel like a lot of people feel like politics is something that happens over there. It's external from me. Uh, I can vote once every four years, so I can choose, or I can be part of choosing which play is on the stage. But other than that, I'm supposed to sit here quietly and watch. There's no point of engagement for me. And the reason I like using the analogy of the fourth wall is because it's only used in theater in the context of, anyone? Breaking the fourth wall. You don't really talk about the fourth wall unless you're talking about how it sometimes gets broken. So an actor breaks the fourth wall by glancing at the audience, even like a wink. So if I'm acting out some Shakespeare play and I look at Donna for a second, it's like, I'm not actually, you know, I'm, a, I'm just an actor and you're there. And you know I'm here and I know you're here and you know that I know that you're here. And you're breaking the fourth wall because it isn't two separate realities, it's one. The audience could theoretically break the fourth wall too by heckling the stage. You're saying, I'm here. You're not actually, you know, in Shakespeare land. You're on a stage and I can see you and, and for whatever reason I'm a jerk and I'm heckling. In theater is rude, but in politics, it's engagement. So how do we break the fourth wall at City Hall and create a culture where people know that they're supposed to be on the stage? And the stage isn't something you watch. Politics isn't a spectator sport. The stage is an opportunity for you to submit your input and have a two-way dialogue. We need politicians looking at the audience, and we need an audience that knows that you're not into politics if you just read headlines and consume sound bites. You're a spectator. You're in the politics if you're actually participating, if you're talking to your city councilor, if you're going to city hall, if you're part of your neighborhood association, you're part of a nonprofit group, you're advocating for change. That's politics, you're on a stage. So we need to transform the way we view politics, not that it's something over there, but it's something that's all around me that I can reach out and touch. And we also need people to know how to get on that stage. That's what the City Idol project was. You know, when I go to see a play, it doesn't occur to me that, oh, maybe next year I can be in the play, right? I'm not an actor. But when people should, in some part of their heads, when they're getting really frustrated with politicians saying, well, maybe I should run, right? The qualifications for elected office these days are very low. The bar has been set to three. I mean, you could just look at our council right now and some of the folks there, and none of you should feel that you don't have what it takes to replace some of those folks. So what I did with this project is I put forward 36 concrete recommendations of how we could create a more participatory and inclusive municipal government. Now, some of it relates to design work, which I think you'll be interested in. So the first section of each, there was 36 recommendations broken down into 12 uh, categories, and each one was designed as a four foot by three foot um, panel. So it was, a, it was an actual traveling exhibit that would fill in the entire room. And the last panel listed all 36 recommendations that people could put green stickers on the ones they liked. So it was an interactive voting process. Otherwise, the exhibit itself would have a fourth wall, where you're just there to silently look at the art and not interact. But people could also put comment cards. We had a mail all on the bottom and hundreds of blank comment cards. In the art gallery, people could write comments under each board. And that started to fill up. It was really beautiful. And this has, been, this has traveled around now. So the first one is about public notices, and I talked about this in my TED talk. This is allegedly City of Toronto's public notice to inform the public that something very important might be happening in your neighborhood. Um, it's designed poorly. To, to, you know, to be, it's generous to use the word design in this context, because it's not designed at all. It's designed in Microsoft Word, which most of you know is not a design program, and it's designed by a lawyer and lawyers shouldn't design things. Um, you need to get halfway down this notice to even find out what address it's about. Why would anyone even have gotten halfway down if they didn't know that it affected their lives in the first place? Why would you be reading a notice that could be about anything? 
obviously this has to be at the top. And then you have to go all the way to the bottom to find out how to actually submit your input. They're not even using certain technologies which have come down in price drastically in the last 10 years, such as bold and underline. <laughs> <laughs> like, no effort's being made here whatsoever to identify what the actual message is and how to highlight it. Um, so in my TED talk, I put forward this hypothetical question, how stupid it would look if the private sector advertised in the same way, and if Nike wanted to sell a pair of shoes and designed an ad like this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, it probably is a good shoe. This is actually a more informative ad than any ad I've seen in my life. But has anyone here ever seen an ad that looks like this in a magazine, in a newspaper? Why not? The reason why you've never seen an ad like this is because Nike actually wants you to buy the shoes, which kind of makes me think the city doesn't want you to participate because they're, they're not making the most basic efforts to design things that people would notice. Um, this is a print version. It's also the, the version you put in front of buildings. And um, it's just as bad, if, if not worse. Again, like, no color, no images. Look at this file numbering. Why is that file numbering 13 digits? Every car in Ontario is uniquely identified by a seven-digit number. And the Toronto Planning Department needs 13 to identify 100 or 200 planning applications. So I'm supposed to phone up Barry Brooks and say hi. I'm calling about file 11-225334. As a citizen, I know I have something to say. It's ridiculous. They also use a lot of alienating language. Um, so I've circled a whole bunch of words here that I'll go through in a second that I think are kind of insider jargon. The nonprofit sector has a, has a big problem with this. And then they say stuff like, come to our statute to our public meeting. And they always say information we posted once the meeting's scheduled, and then they never post anything. So there's the file number. There's the email to go to. And then they come. You want to get more people out to a statutory public meeting? First step, don't call it a statutory public meeting. This sounds terrible. It sounds like you don't even want to have it. Like we have to have this meeting. Imagine if I invited you to my statutory birthday party. It sounds like I've you know, been forced to have this party, and I probably don't even want to invite you. My mom said I have to invite all my classmates. Right? Um, then they use really alienating language like this, including a four-story podium. So who does urban design here? Anyone know what a podium is in terms of architecture? Yeah, there you go. This is the word they're using to talk about. Really, no one? I thought one or two. They also spelled story mode. It has oh. an E in it. Did they do that wrong? Did I do that wrong? <coughs> Oops, sorry, you did. <laughs> I don't know, thanks. I'm sure there's like 100, 100 presentations, probably 10,000 people. I'm going to fix that. Who said that? Thank you. Um, anyways, they don't spell that wrong, but they use the word podium, which is? Well, you probably know if you know how to spell the story wrong. Okay, so a podium, a podium is, is um, yeah, it is one of those. A podium is when you have a tower, a condo tower, and the base of it, the top, the bottom two or three floors are usually wider, and that's called a podium, right? But you're probably thinking, yeah, something like this. So the person who's going to read that sign and think, oh, why the heck would I want to <laughs> podium? Why, why would I want that? I mean, the noise will be enormous, <laughs> energy consumption, and it doesn't, it just doesn't match your architectural feel of um, the street. Um, but you're laughing, but you're laughing because I've turned it into such a visual um, you know, example of how stupid they're being. But we should laugh at these signs as they are. Um, uh, four levels of, now I'm looking at everything for spotting mistakes, just because I'm scared now. Uh, does PowerPoint have a spell check? Oh, story wouldn't get through a spell check. I hate those when you spell something wrong, but it's still a word. <laughs> it includes four levels of below grade parking. Just sounds like crappy parking, right? Like I want high grade parking in my neighborhood. Um, below grade means what? You can guess, yeah, underground. But that's what, that's what we say. Like we, when, when I refer to something as under the ground, I say underground. But no one says below grade. So why would you use language that no one uses, right? When I think of below grade, I think of my report card from grade 12. <laughs> <laughs> That's below grade. <laughs> um, imagine if the subway system uh, in, in, in London was called the below grade instead of the underground. It would just, that would be kind of dumb. Or imagine a, a band with, a, with the name of Velvet Below Grade. <laughs> That's a stupid, this should look as stupid as our signs. Our signs are ridiculous. The government is making no effort. And if people don't show up to a public consultation based on those signs, it's not apathy. It's intentional exclusion on the part of the city. And the reason I wanted to share this with you 
Um, well, let, let me go to the, 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 the punchline. This is a good news story. I don't. I, I like to complain clearly, but I like to complain with with the next step, like a constructive proposal following the complaint. So I did. Um, first, I looked around all over North America for best practices. Is there a city doing this right? And no one is. Like everyone's doing it that way. It's not a Toronto thing. It's a it's a universe thing. So on my blog, I invited designers to to show how they would design a public notice if they were trying to meet the four following requirements. Number one, catch people's attention with basic design elements, which all of you know. Number two, highlight and emphasize the most important piece of information that lets the consumer know that this is about them and their neighborhood and their lives. Number three, highlight the points of engagement so they know how they can participate instead of just watching the stage. How do I get on the stage? How do I heckle? How do I talk to the actors? And number four, most importantly, proactively encourage people to participate. Just like the corporation do. They don't just say, here's the shoe. They, they hit us over the head at the elevators, at the gas pumps, like, buy our stuff. And if you bought it, buy it again, and then buy some more, and give it to your friends. It's a good Christmas present. And then buy more, and buy more, and buy more. And our new model is out. So the one you bought last year is garbage. Buy, 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 buy. If you want to get people engaged, it's got to be engage, 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 engage. And if you engage last year, engage again. And this is why it's good for you, and for your family, and your children, and your neighbor, and your community. So, how have you designed an ad for doing those four things? And people have very busy lives. Like, I'm, I'm not joking here and say the most important part is that pitch. Because why would someone take an hour out of their week to go to community meeting, right? They've got kids, and, a, and, a, and their family, and, and, and work, and laundry, and dishes. You've got to really convince them that this hour out of your schedule, or three hours, will actually make your life better. Uh, and I think we can tap into people's selfishness. I don't think we have to get people to engage in politics because it's better for the world and it's some kind of obligation as a citizen. Screw that. Let's tap into people's selfishness. This will make your life better. The bus will come sooner. The library will be open more. Whatever issue it is you care about, the minimum wage will be higher. It's not for me to figure out what, what you know floats your boat. So we can convince people that public participation allows you to change the world around you in a positive way for you and your family. I think selfishness is a very valuable thing that we can tap in to people's lives. So here's some of the designs. And as soon as you see it, and contrast that in your mind with what I showed you before, it's almost like staggering the degree to which the city has made no effort. Different size fonts, nice fonts, color, um, slogans, like just thought about wording, icons of how you can participate, phone, email, public meeting, the date of the meeting, that's revolutionary. Um, we're listening. Um, speak up Toronto. Can make it? We still want to hear from you. Exclamation mark. Also, very cost effective tool to use. What do you think? Let us know. Join us for a community meeting. Um, the address is in blue. Brilliant. Again, icons. Uh, before and after. Very smart. We need your input. Have your say. Exclamation mark. Come to the meeting. This is basic stuff. But as soon as you give it a moment's thought, you know what it's supposed to look like. Here's another one. This is the most exciting one. Because this one didn't come from a random designer who saw my blog. This one came from the village of Pemberton, British Columbia. It's right beside Whistler. They had seen my TED Talk. They had seen my blog and seen the submissions I just showed you and actually redesigned their official municipal public notice based on the designs I just showed you. You can see it. Have your say. We're listening, the icons, they stole all the elements from these designers that volunteered their time and actually redesigned your notice, which is fine. Um, and, and it's not the most amazing notice you know, we could have, but compared to what I showed you before, it's a huge step. So it shows, again, how much impact you can have in the world, because I was just blogging, right, and getting designers to volunteer their time. Um, so I thought it'd be fun to give them an award. These guys should get an award. Uh, the Dazzling Notice Award, the DNA, 2012 winner for Excellence in Government Outreach. And here's a great tip for community organizing. If you design an award and print it and frame it and give it to someone, even if it's just from you, what's your name? Uh, John. Yeah, it's an award from John. They'll be over the moon. Because it's an award. This is me presenting the award. This is the mayor of Pemberton. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, it's the CAO of uh, Everton. Yeah. This, is, this is a Jill Brooks fan who, who actually did the design. And they're like, we got an award, right? So now I've turned into this national awards program. It's dazzleawards.ca. And we're using guilt and embarrassment to get You can tap into the negative elements of humanity that make positive change happen. You know, which city's going to win the Dazzle Award for 2013? And I was able to get, I've got Nahid Menchie's chief of staff on our jury panel. I've got um, uh, Jen Keithmack, the chief planner of Toronto. Peter Milchin, who's the um, chair of the Planning and Growth Management Committee. I've got folks from across Canada on this jury panel for the Dazzling Notice Awards, which don't actually exist except in my head and now on a website. And now I guess it does exist because we're going to give one out. And cities are actually submitting nominations for this year, right? <laughs> And but all this comes back to good design. Um, so I, so let, let me just hold up this for one second, and um, I'm actually running out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed up a bit, because I want to do Q&A. Wow, I'm really running out of time. I do this all the time. Um, I want, how many of you are d designers? Graphic designers? How many of you produce some form of media, or learning, what kind? All of it, multimedia, podcasting, they all do video. Amazing. So whether you do graphic design, web design, video production, editing, writing, you name it, any creative e expression, the nonprofit sector could be transformed by a few hours of your volunteer time. Whatever you end up doing with a career is great. If you can find rewarding work with design and video, great. You might not. You might end up making ads that you hate, because that's life. Um, I want you to know that whether you find that rewarding work or not, Volunteering a bit of your time, even now, the nonprofit sector will be so transformative. Because not only is the city designing bad ads, a lot of charities are, and a lot of nonprofits are, especially small grassroots groups. So if there's an issue you care about, I want to encourage you as, as media producers to Google the issue, find out what groups are working on it in Toronto, call them up and say, can I make a video for you? Or can I help you with your website? And they'll be over the moon. And you can allow them to have a louder voice. You're giving them a megaphone. Because marketing works, good design works. Effective videos are so powerful. And people are mostly exposed to effective videos by watching ads on TV. We need to give the nonprofit sector the same tools. And you're in an amazing position to do that. And I just wanted to share that with you. The idea behind it is that I think people, one of the many reasons people are pushed away from politics is polarization and partisanship and everything being divided into these wedge issues, black versus white, urban versus suburban, cyclist versus cars, left versus right, up versus down, whatever. And politics, politicians like to create wedge issues and divide us. And it turns people off because people don't like the, the conflict, and also the answer to each problem usually lies somewhere in the middle, not on the edges. And that middle uh, moderate voice isn't always there. So I thought it would be fun to get people from the far right and the far left at City Hall to work together in something creative. So this is Tom from Mayor Rob Ford's office, and this is Mike Layton, Jack Layton's son. So you've definitely got the two ends of the spectrum there, although Paul is probably more on the left of Mike. And I just want to point this out because there's no rules to political advocacy. I mean, I could have held a press conference or even a blog post about how we have to overcome partisanship. No one would have cared. I could have tweeted about it, no one would have cared. And I thought, what if we had a ban? Which sounds kind of crazy. And I had some friends be like, are you serious? You're gonna, they're not going to do it first, so they're going to work with each other. And they probably suck as musicians. And you know, like all these negative reasons why it wouldn't work. But I think this was the most creative way I could come up with to share an idea with the city that we could actually all work together. And politics could be a place of politicians sharing ideas and disagreeing in a way that's actually constructive and having intellectual debate rather than just seeing it like, like a sport or a military battle. Um, so uh, um, that's it. Um, thank you for your time, and I have like, two minutes for questions. Oh, and my last message is you can change the world with art and design. Okay.